Over the last few years, Git has grown enormously in popularity, and with its great power and flexibility, it's no wonder why. But with all of this power and flexibility, it still carries a reputation of being scary or complicated. We all know somebody who has a horror story of how they've lost days of work to the wrong git command. You probably know that person in the office who performs some kind of dark magic with git, the one others go to when they have problems. Not so long ago, I was working on a team that had recently moved from another source control system to git, we didn't have that person, so we played it safe, aware of Git's power, but unsure of how to tap into it. I decided to dive deep into Git and understand it more, to demystify its power and help my team to work better. What I discovered was the distance between novice and expert is not that big. You too can be that person that everybody goes to for their sage Git advice. All it takes is an understanding of the building blocks that Git uses, and suddenly you're able to understand more complex operations and plan their impact. So before we dive deep into Git and how it stores its data, and what each of its operations do, let's remind ourselves of the main differences between Git and a more traditional version control system. Of course, when I say more traditional, what I really mean is centralized version control. A centralized version control system is when there is a single, central, source server that all clients connect to. Consider this engineering team. There are four engineers all working on the same code. When one of them wants to make a change to the file, they first check out the current version of that file. And then make the change, in this case turning it red. When they're ready, they then commit or check in the changed file sending it back to the central repository. Another developer can check out this file and then make further changes. Again, sharing it back to the central repository when they are ready. Now, what happens if the remaining engineers on our team both want to make a change at the same time? They start by both checking out the most recent version and each making a change. In this case, one is turning it yellow and the other purple. Let's say the engineer in the bottom right finishes their work first, so they commit their change in the normal way. But now, the latest file is ahead of the one that was used to make the yellow change. They must resolve this conflict before continuing. They start by getting the latest version, then merging their changes into it to create a new resolved version of the file. Now they can continue to commit as before. There are some limitations of centralized version control. The central server is critical to your business and must be backed up regularly and protected from downtime. Even if the server is running perfectly, your developers can run into issues if, for example, they are on a flight or their internet has failed. Without access to the source server, they may struggle to be productive. You've probably used a centralized version control system at some point. Some popular examples include SVN, TFS, and Perforce. So how is distributed version control different? Well, because it's distributed, of course. Okay, let's take a proper look. So here's our dev team again. Only this time, rather than a single central repository, they each have their own self-contained local one. Each of these repositories started as an identical clone of another origin repository, but is now self-contained and unaffected by the code that is getting modified elsewhere. They check out, modify, and commit their changes against their personal repository. Of course, that's not very useful, is it? They're supposed to be working together, after all. That's okay though, because these repositories were all clones of each other at some point, we can still synchronize them together. This can either be directly with each other, or with a central server. Note that being distributed doesn't mean there isn't a central repository, it just means it's not necessary. So how does distributed source control work with Git specifically? Imagine this setup. You have a single developer already working in their own repository. You start by making a clone of the repository using the git clone command. This can be from any available clone, but here you can see it is taken directly from another engineer. 
When the repository was cloned, a link was created between them, so that our new repository considers the one it came from to be its origin. The origin is the place where we will push your changes to and pull their changes from. Now, whenever you make changes, you commit them to your local repository using the git commit command. You can see here that your change, shown in red, is only in your repository and has not yet been shared with the origin repository. We do that using the git push command, which pushes the changes in your current branch back to the origin repository. Note that when you run the push command, you only push the changes in the branch you are currently working on to the origin repository, not any other changes you may have made, but we'll talk more about branches in a moment. So it seems simple enough then, so why is it that so many people find Git scary? We've all heard the horror stories, but where do they come from? The challenge with Git is that it's extremely simple to get started. It feels reasonably familiar to other source control systems, yet it's also extremely powerful with a massive pile of complex command line arguments. When you get Git right, you feel like a god, master of source control, but when you get it wrong, you're humbled. At this point, you'll meet a friend, a colleague, a dapper man making videos on the internet who will tell you Git is easy once you understand it. They'll say something wise sounding, like Git's power is really unlocked once you realise that each of its operations is just a graph manipulation. Yeah, right, uh, thanks. Personally, I think it's simpler than that. We can rewrite this as Git is a bunch of coloured circles with arrows pointing to them. When you run a Git command, we move those arrows around. Much better. Let's take a look at the Git graph and start to get an understanding of how your code is stored. What you're looking at here is a really simple history of some code. Each blue circle is a discrete change, or commit, made to the code by a developer. Each one has a link back to one parent, that is the commit before it that this was a change to, or an addition to. Let's give this a little arrow pointing to the end so we know it is our main branch. In the middle of all these nice blue circles, you're probably wondering where that crafty yellow one came from. Well, that's a merge node from one of our branches we used. Let's put an arrow on that one too, so we know it's our new feature branch. Nice. Maybe the product we're working on also has a release branch that we take from the main branch when we are preparing to ship a new version. However, like all software products, it's never quite right the first time and requires a little stabilization. So there are a couple of commits in there too. Of course, we want those improvements to make their way into our main branch too. So there's a merge mode bringing those changes back. And there's our branch name. Now, let's take this one step further and say our stabilization was not as thorough as we had hoped and we'd had a bug slide through. Now we have a lot of unhappy customers, but engineering on the next version has already begun. So we make another branch called Hotfix. This time we base it off the release branch. And so we can find the code for the release of our app easily later. Let's add a tag called 1.1. Fabulous. Now you're familiar with how the kind of things you do every day look once we draw them on the graph. The graph flows from left to right, and each node builds off the nodes before it. Shall we take a closer look at what's inside each node on our graph? This is a commit node. It represents a change to the code, a commit that you have made as a developer, and it contains some metadata about the commit, such as the time and date that it was made, the name and email address of the change author, and the author's commit message. It also contains a full copy of each file that was changed in a commit. Some other source control systems that you might have used store each commit as a partial delta, only storing the lines that were changed in that commit. When you switch to a version, the tool will walk along each commit and reconstruct the file one change at a time. But that's not the case with Git. One of the core design principles in Git is that it should be able to move between branches and changes very quickly, even for large repositories. In each commit node, Git stores a full copy of each file that was changed, 
all other unchanged files are simply symlinks to the previous version of the file. Finally, the commit contains a link to the previous node in the graph and a unique ID that was derived from the content of this commit and the ID of its parent node. This is a merge node. It represents the bringing together of two, or more, branches. Just like the commit node, it has a date and committed metadata, as well as a collection of changed files. Because even though this change is bringing together branches, it may contain changes of its own to resolve conflicts between these branches. Unlike a commit node, which contains a link to a single parent node, a merge node has links to all of the parents it is bringing together. For most common use cases we'll be discussing here, this will be a single feature branch being merged into a single trunk, resulting in two parents. But that's not essential. In more advanced scenarios, a merge could have many parents, but we're not going to cover that here today. Remember I said Git was designed from the very start to make moving between changes really fast. It does this by making each branch as simple as possible, just a bunch of changed files and some symlinks. How simple is a branch? A branch is just a text file containing the ID of the node and the head of that tree. When you switch to a branch, Git simply gets the ID from the branch's text file and updates the files on disk to match the commit it points to. So that's the basics out of the way. Let's take a deeper look at some Git operations and how they work with the Git graph. Let's imagine you're new to a project and you've not yet got your hands on a copy of the code. What happens when you clone it? You start using the git clone command, specifying the address of the origin you wish to clone from. Remember, this could be a shared central server or some other clone. When the command is executed, a complete copy is made of the main branch, including its entire history from when it was initialized. The clone repository is itself entirely self-contained. You may travel up and down the history graph and make changes or commit code without a connection to or knowledge of the origin repository. Note how only the main branch was cloned. When you ran the clone command, a link was added to the repository containing the address of the origin. If you need to clone one of the other branches, Git will automatically go to the origin and clone that branch for you when you try and switch to it which will of course require a network connection at that moment. You can clone the entire repository at once if you wish by adding the dash a argument to the clone command. Right, so you've got yourself a copy of the code. Naturally, you want to start making changes. So let's take a look at how that works then. When you move your code to a specific change node, the head node of a branch perhaps, Git will change all the files on your disk to match the version that corresponds to that change. Git then automatically tracks the state of the files in the repository to detect if they are removed or modified, or new ones are added. This is entirely local, so you don't need a network connection for this to work. These detected files can either be staged or unstaged. The difference between these is not very technical, but allows you to be more tactical with which files you are planning on checking in. Perhaps you have made a number of important changes to resolve a bug that you, of course, want to share with the team, but also have some debug code that you don't want to check in. You can leave the debug code unstaged and stage only the changes you want to share. We're getting ahead of ourselves though. At this point, you're just sitting there with a checked out branch and a bunch of changes. So what happens when you commit these changes? Having modified the code, you first stage the files you want to share using the git add command. Note, some IDs may or may not stage files for you automatically to save you from this step. There are also some shortcuts you can take to add whole folders at once if you need to but I'll leave that as a homework exercise for you to look up. You now commit these changes using the git commit command. This creates a new commit node in the graph with the branch's current head node as its parent. Finally, the branch's pointer is updated to point to your new node. You can do this as many times as you like to add multiple new nodes to the end of the graph, 
each one using the previous as its parent. All of your shiny new changes are now added to the graph, but remember, each Git repository is a completely self-contained entity, and right now these changes exist only for you. So let's take a look at how you go about sharing these changes back with the other developers. Remember how when you cloned your repository, it created a link to the repository's origin? Well, we need to make use of this to push our changes to it. We do this using the git push command. When you run this command, the commit nodes that are just added are copied to the origin repository and its head pointer advanced to points to the newly added nodes. So what about the inverse process? What happens if someone else on your team has pushed their changes, but they are not in your local repository? Well, the opposite of pushing is naturally pulling. As it stands, your local repository is not aware that there are new nodes in the origin graph, so it still looks the way it did when you cloned. To update its knowledge of the new nodes in the origin repository, we use the git fetch command. Just like when we pushed, this copies nodes from one repository to the other. However, it does not advance the head pointer of our branch just yet. The new nodes are now copied to our repository, so a network connection is not required after this point. But if you were to look at the file system, you'd see that the files are not yet been updated. To do that, we use the git pull command. This advances the head pointer of our local branch to the most recent node, and in the process, updates the file system to the most recent changes. Now our local repository matches the state of the origin repository. Note, if you have committed changes to your local branch, you will be able to run the git fetch command, but you'll have to resolve any conflicts when you pull. More on that a bit later though. We've looked at how the graph can be used to store not only individual changes to your code, but also diverging branches. So how do we bring all these branches together into one super awesome product with all of the changes in? Let's work through an example together. Consider your team has been working on a project for a while. You've got a few commits in your main branch already. But your team want to start work on a large feature that will take a while. So that you can continue to track your code and to make changes without polluting the main branch, you create a new branch for your new feature. Work is progressing well on your new feature, and there are quite a few commits in the graph. But the rest of your team have been hard at work too, and the main branch has moved on quite a bit since you branched off it. When you're ready to combine these two streams of work, we create a merge commit. We do this using the git merge command. When we run this command, a new node is added to the graph with both the main and our branch as its parents. The head pointer of the main branch is then advanced to point to this merge node. Any future commits are now added to the graph after this node. We've taken a look at how a simple merge is achieved, but in the real world, it's likely that some of the changes in those two branches will have modified the same file. Remember how Git stores changes by storing the entire file, not just the changes to it. Now let's dig into how to resolve conflicts when merging. Just as before, we have two branches that we want to bring together, but this time we cannot because of a merge conflict. Before we complete this merge, we must resolve the conflict by taking the two conflicting files and bringing their content together. This merge file is then added to the commit node. Note that for simple conflicts where different lines have been edited in the same file, Git is able to resolve these conflicts automatically without requiring user intervention, but it follows the same process here, it just does it automatically. Here's another example of merging. Just as before, you've taken a branch off the main branch and made some commits, but this time the rest of the team has been less active, and there are no changes in the main branch. In this case, when we run the git merge command, git will do a fast forward merge. With a fast forward merge, the head pointer of the main branch is advanced forwards to match the head pointer of our feature branch, so a merge node is not created. 
from the developer's perspective, this achieves the same result. Anybody looking at the main branch will see both changes from the original main branch and those from the feature branch. However, it's very slightly different in how it's recorded in the repository history. Because the head pointer was moved to the end of the branch, no permanent record was made that there was ever a second branch merged in. Depending on your specific use, this may be problematic for things such as change requests, where you would like there to be a permanent record of the approval of the code being added. By default, Git will prefer a fast forward merge if it's possible, but you can override this behavior using the dash no ff flag when merging. Now, a merge node is created for the merge even if it was not necessary. This node will forever live in the commit tree as a record that the merge happened. We've talked through some of the core activities when working in a team with Git and how those activities interact with the graph. Now, let's examine how we can use the Git graph to our advantage with some more exciting features in Git. We understand now that our local repository is self-contained and any changes we make are only visible to us until we choose to share them back with Origin. The benefit of this is that we can do whatever we like in our repository. It is ours after all. Consider this scenario. You've made some changes and committed them to your local repository, but as you're reviewing your changes, you notice you've made a mistake that you want to correct. Traditionally, you would make your correction and commit it, forever leaving a record in the graph of your mistake that anybody looking back on the history of the file would have to wade through. It's not about making yourself look good. The fact that you corrected a typo is of no benefit to somebody looking back over the history of the file to understand how a feature has developed over time. With Git, you can keep your history clean by simply modifying the previous commit before you share it. We do this by adding the dash dash amend flag to the Git command. When you do this, a new commit node is created that contains both the changes from the previous commit and the current stage changes merged together as if you'd got them correct on the first try. The head pointer of the branch is then moved to point to this new node, effectively modifying, amending, the previous commit. But notice how this didn't actually amend the previous commit. It created a new one and changed the head pointer. So what happens to that old node? Well, it's still there in the git graph, but as nothing points to it, there's no way to check it out unless you still know its commit hash. Because of this, it will remain unreferenced in the git graph for a while and eventually be detected and garbage collected automatically. There are some other ways of manipulating the previous commit too. Perhaps you're looking to make a more involved modification to the previous commit than a simple amend. You accidentally committed a file you didn't mean to, or you committed to the incorrect branch, for example. In these situations, you can move or reset the head pointer back to the previous commit without changing the files you've checked out. Essentially, uncommitting and restoring the files to their stage state. To move the head pointer of the current branch, we make use of the git reset command. Here we're using the head squiggle one argument to specify that we want to move the head pointer back one node from the current branch head. To tell Git that we want to move the head pointer without updating the files on our system, we add the dash dash mixed argument. As you can see, the head pointer moves back one commit, but the files were not updated. They become uncommitted changes that we can modify and commit again. We can also use the reset command to clean up changes we don't want to keep. Imagine you've been conducting an experimental change for a bug fix. You've got changes all over the place and it's a bit of a mess. You're ready to clean away and start afresh on a new strategy. To do this, you can use the git reset command with the dash dash hard flag. This instructs git to restore the state of the local file system to that indicated by the chosen node. Bear in mind that this will immediately destroy any uncommitted changes you may have made without warning nor confirmation. 
As these changes were never added to the graph, there's no record of their existence, so no garbage collection. They're just gone. Forever. You've been warned. By this point, you're probably getting pretty comfortable with how branches are represented in the git graph, and how individual changes to those branches are stored as changed nodes. We've seen how we can move the head pointer around to achieve our goals, so let's look at some more interesting things we can do with those nodes. Imagine you're working on a feature in its own branch. You're pretty deep into development and the branch contains a lot of commits. But you've got a problem. Your code isn't working expected and it's blocking you. You mention your problem to a colleague and they say it's a known problem and they fixed it already in another branch. Now, how do you take only the commit that fixes your problem into your branch without taking all of the other changes too? With a cherry pick. You can perform a cherry pick using the git cherry pick command and pass the hash of the commit you want to take into the current branch. When that command is executed, the changes made in the commit node are copied and applied to the head version of the files in your current branch. The head pointer is then advanced to point to this new node. Note how only the changes were copied across, not the exact version of the file from that branch. This means that any changes in your branch are maintained. If the changes being cherry-picked would cause a conflict with those in the current branch, you must resolve them during the process. The resolved changes are then committed to the new commit node. So that's how you can copy changes from one branch to another, but what if you want to move a whole branch around? Consider this scenario, you took a branch off the main branch so you could start working on a new feature, and you started making good progress with a good few commits already. However, it's later decided that your changes should be part of a feature that another team is working on. They've got their own branch from main, and also a good few commits in. When you first made your branch, it was based off the main branch. However, you need it to be based off the other team's branch. You need to rebase your branch. You can do this using the git rebase command. When you run this command, each of the commits in your branch are, one at a time, copied into new commit nodes parented off the target branch, in a very similar way to when you cherry-picked single nodes. If there are any merge conflicts, they can be resolved as the node is copied, you may be asked to make several merge resolutions as the progress progresses through the nodes. Once the nodes have been copied, the head pointer of your branch is then moved to point to the new nodes. As the original nodes are now unreferenced, they will be garbage collected by Git at a later point. Having an understanding of how to manipulate the nodes already in the Git graph unlocks some powerful possibilities when using Git. By skillfully taking control of the nodes in the graph, you can change the history of your commits to correct errors and account for changes in plans. We just worked through a simple rebase on how it can move commits between branches in your repository, but now let's examine other ways we can use the rebase command to make changes to our branches. Consider that you've been working on a branch and you've added four commits to the end, A, B, C, and D. But you're not happy with those commits, and you want to make some changes to them. This can be done using an interactive rebase by adding the i argument to the git rebase command. Here, we've specified we want to interactively rebase the four most recent commits back from the head pointer. When this is executed, a text file is opened in an editor. By default, this will probably be vim. If you're not familiar working with vim, there are a number of cheat sheets available or you can change the default editor in Git to something else by using the config. This file acts as a sort of instruction guide for what you want Git to do with each of our four commits. Once the file is closed, Git will follow the instructions one by one, top to bottom. Here, A has the pick instruction. For this, Git will copy the original A commit unchanged into a new temporary branch. Commit B has the fix-up instruction. 
For this, Git will take the content of the B commit and merge it into the copy of A it just made, as if you made those changes in one commit all along. Commit C has the reword instruction. This allows the author to modify the commit message than that node. While processing this instruction, Git will open a second text editor with the original commit message in, allowing you to change it. When you close the editor, Git will create a new commit with your updated message and add it to the temporary branch with the others. Finally, commit D also has the pick command, just like A, and is simply copied to the temporary branch. With all the instructions followed, the head pointer from the branch being rebased is now moved to point to the end of the branch we just created. As with other rebase operations, the now unreferenced branch is eventually garbage collected and deleted. With the rebase completed, you may run into a small issue. If this branch was previously pushed to a remote repository, you're now in the position where you have different commits in your remote repository to your local one. This is because you effectively re rewritten history and it no longer matches the history on the remote. To resolve this, we use the F or force argument in the push command. This will tell Git to entirely replace the remote branch with the content of the local one, permanently, deleting any changes on the remote branch that are no longer needed. Wait though! Changing the history of your branch is an incredibly useful and powerful tool, but you know what they say about great power. I just mentioned how when pushing a branch with modified history, you must force push it. However, you should only ever do this if you are the only person making use of the branch. Take a look at this. You've created a branch and made a few commits to it, and you share this with a colleague. Then, using the sage guidance of an excellent Git presentation you recently watched on the internet, you change your history. However, while you've been doing this, your colleague has added some commits of their own to their local copy. Now when they try and pull your changes, they experience a number of confusing merge errors and are not very happy with you. I don't think this means you shouldn't play with history, but you should be very aware of anybody else who may be relying on it before you do. Wow, that's a lot of things we just learned. Should we quickly review everything we just discussed? We looked at how to clone a repository, how to make your first commit, and how to push that commit back to origin. We then looked at how to work with changes from other engineers by fetching and pulling. Next, we discussed creating and merging branches and looked at how to manipulate the head pointer of those branches to move commits between them. Finally, we looked at ways to modify the history of a branch to clean up our workflow. You made it to the end! Congratulations, and thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and you now have an understanding of the principles at work inside Git and how you can use them in your everyday workflow. There is of course still a huge amount more Git can do, and with this foundation in mind, learning about these features and putting them into use should be both fun and rewarding. If you found this useful or entertaining, please drop a like below. I'd also love to hear about your journey with Git. Leave a comment telling me where you use Git and what, if any, parts you found complicated at first, and how did you work through them? With that in mind, all that's left for me to do is thank you once again for watching and wish you happy gitting. Goodbye.